also coming onto the stage tonight, soloist Alexander Toradza and conductor Thierry Fisher joining the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. Lexel, I would be grateful if you told two stories which I think illuminate differences between Russian and American musical and cultural life. First, the story about your father and Glier, and secondly, the story about Ella Fitzgerald and Oscar Peterson. Can we start with the Glier story? Nineteen thirty-eight. Uh, you know, at the age of 16, and my father, Georgian composer, was lucky to get into Moscow Conservatory. And was lucky uh, primarily because I mean, his knowledge of Russian was quite limited. And, but somehow he got through his examinations and colloquiums and um, and got into the class of you know, Rain Gold Clier, who was a very huge name in Russian culture, conservatory. Um, and uh, they had a very, very amicable relationship until Clier's uh, death. Photo of Clier was not only on the piano of my father's, but another photo was right here on the left side on the wall where piano uh, stands even now at our uh, apartment in Tbilisi. He would often glance and see Clier's pretty serious face with glasses, but with very sweet uh, writing. Clear gave this photo to father with extremely sweet writing. relationship uh, uh, was far more than uh, only personal in terms of uh, professional in terms of in terms of um, really the general attitude uh, of most of uh, Soviet Russian including Georgian professors towards their students and one, it's one very, very telling uh, story is that uh, uh, father at the age of 
17 and 18, uh, uh, was supplementing his, uh, his living there. So then he, uh, because of his affinity, very soon he achieved um, enough notoriety to be become one of the pianists in a, a very distinguished restaurant which exists even today called Metropol restaurant. Very close to huge uh, Dzerzhinsky uh, KGB building. Um, now it's called differently, but anyways. One um, uh, evening, Glier with other his colleagues, uh, professors of Moscow Conservatory, went to dine in this uh, in this big restaurant. Uh, it's a big room. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, while, while getting comfortable and ordering food, you heard that some, 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 some wonderful jazz music is coming from the, uh, from the, the corner, uh, including a pretty, pretty good uh, piano playing. And he asked uh, the waiter, uh, who is there? Who is this uh, guy in the playing uh, piano? There, and uh, and the guy said, "Well, this is there's some young young uh, young boy. His name is David, and he's uh, he's from conservatory, by the way." And Claire was extremely surprised. Conservatory, David? Who that must be? I mean, I I, I cannot imagine. And he got up and went closer to to the space where this little group was located. I was on sees his student, my father, sitting and banging around. Father never told me this story, for whatever reason, but my uncle did. And as much as I know from my uncle, father froze, obviously sees his professor <laughs> right in front of him at the piano, very angry. And uh, father said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Professor Clear, but you know, I have to make, uh, I have to make some money, I need to support my mother and sister back in Georgia, send them money. And he says, how much you make a week here? You have to go and finish your symphony for exam. We have exam very soon. And father mumbled some figure. Claire went to his pocket and gave him like months or whatever, huge amount of money for the little student sitting there. But that was the attitude, you know. Uh, also my, uh, most of my, most of my teachers, uh, it was not only a music uh, relation, musical relationship or piano relationship. So it was entire, entire being of student, student was taken very personally by, uh, by every, every teacher I was lucky to be a student uh, with. And um, so that episode uh, has very big, very big, was very Im impactful for, for my life, personal life. And um, not only clear, never, ever, ever, ever uh, charged for additional lessons or additional hours, but Actually, vice versa. He was the one who is, was helping the students, including financially. And my father's attitude towards his students was absolutely the very similar. Uh, I remember numerous, numerous, many, many uh, conservatory students in Tbilisi Conservatory would come here, uh, come to him, and never ever he charged them for this, uh, 
lessons or additional lessons. By the way, this attitude uh, remains in me very strongly so, even in the, at the West. Um, I uh, do the same, very same. And not only, not only that, but I take each student as personally as I can. Uh, and I'm not talking about music alone. Everything my student lived with, uh, I always feel that I have to share that, that life and be as much of a positive influence as I can. What year might this have been when Glier heard your father playing at the restaurant? This, this probably was 40, 1940, so 40, 41, because then in June, of course, uh, war started. And by that time, uh, everybody basically, especially with uh, music and opera and ballet, and, uh, they, uh, the, they were evacuated uh, out of Moscow to the south uh, and some safer places. And father went back to Georgia. Uh, so this is their story. And I mean, Tanev and Glier, Tanev being a, also huge, huge uh, composer of huge importance, uh, theorist, uh, polyphonist, uh, this is end of uh, 19th century in, in Russia, uh, that so Tanev in a theory and Clear in a composition were first Prokofiev's teachers. Uh, when Prokofiev was nine, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, he started to take lessons from these two colossal figures. And uh, if if one has the remote even interest towards the Clear's composition, I advise them to listen to a huge hour, 20 minutes, hour 15, 20 minutes symphony called Ilya Moromets. And um, that's a composition of 19, uh, 10, 11. And uh, the interesting thing is that when uh, I listen to this composition very often, uh, especially lately, uh, because Ilya Muromets is a heroical uh, figure of, uh, of, of actually who lived and fought for the, for the Ukrainian causes in, in 16, 16, 15th century. Uh, it's a huge symphony. And if one listens to it carefully, one hears so many elements which then reappear in Prokofiev's compositions.
Subsequently, for Glier, of course, Prokofiev, he would tell his students, including my father, that Prokofiev have never wrote one note, which is a not, a, not a note of genius. And, uh, and so uh, Prokofiev became one of the most important figure in my father's life. First person who actually, at the age of, I was 14, not yet 15, when father pushed me, not pushed me, but advised me to play Prokofiev Seventh piano sonata, which I play since, which means about many decades. He didn't start it with first sonata or even third sonata, which are much more, much simpler works, but right there in the midst of uh, Prokofievian collision of forces and dramas, he put me on that rail and obviously I probably hardly understood anything then. Uh, but uh, I very much appreciate the entire, whole entire my, my life, uh, that, uh, that relationship between father, Clier, and through Clier with Prokofiev. Jazz was like a, the only fresh water in, 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 in um, let's say, popular music we can get uh, in, a, in Soviet Union. I'm talking in 50s and 60s because by that time jazz was almost forbidden in Soviet Union. So. Um, uh, and uh, there were restaurant ensembles, there were, of course, circus ensembles, but uh, to have a you know, regular, I mean, there were some great jazz musicians in, in Russia, but to have a regular jazz concert per se in, in 50s and 60s was unheard of. So all our information uh, on, on jazz was not not, not to be found in record stores or, or, or radios or television. It was all related to listening, also extremely secretly, to Voice of America Jazz Hour. It's called Voice of America Jazz Hour, and this great, great uh, legendary man, a primarily legendary for, for Soviets and Europe, less so in America, which is is not very surprising because they were not listening to Voice of America. We were listening to Voice of America. Willis Conover, he had like bass profundo guy. It's now 10.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Willis Conover is next with jazz. Time for jazz. Willis Conover in Washington, D.C with the Voice of America Jazz Hour. Very tall, I met him uh, once I got to this, this country, which was in 84, 83 and 84, I met Willis Canover. And it was, uh, it was uh, not unlike, me, not unlike me, meeting Ella Fitzgerald or, or, or Oscar Peterson, whom he would, he would popularize throughout our, 
uh, sort of um, listening system in uh, actually in basements mostly in basements obviously short wave radios and to catch little this 50 45 50 minutes an hour was actually not an hour um, of of new jazz material was uh, was 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 you know you, no american can understand what it meant to us because it meant freedom it meant something we probably won't be able to uh, uh, that attend or listen or uh, or buy their recordings ever ever but it turned out that I was lucky one and in actually uh, when touring uh, uh, touring in the United States in 1978 um, as a Soviet artist as a Soviet artist yes with my official KGB guard next to me uh, uh, who was guarding whom is even questionable. But anyways, it was uh, some of them were nice guys, actually. I remember them all, believe me. I would like to capture the story about what happened in Portland. Mm -hmm. In Portland, Oregon, it's uh, February 16 of 1978, how can I forget that? And next day, February 17th, is a, uh, Ella Fitzgerald's concert. Actually two concerts. And actually not only she has two concerts, but also Oscar Peterson has also two concerts, occupying first part or solo part of the program. And she was playing with... Uh, uh, I remember Joe Paz very well, but also lots of just... Uh, 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 so it was unbelievable opportunity and I had to fly that day uh, to Miami, from Portland to Miami, other end of the huge country. And I had to rehearse with orchestra, but I said to my manager, Shelley Gold, um, <clears throat> that absolutely no way I'm flying. <laughs> from from Portland and he said you can't do that you can't do you ruin not only your career but Soviets will learn why you are staying there and that won't be good I said I have my Soviet KGB right here <clears throat> and he you he can go but I am not going anywhere <laughs> anyway they can they can kick you out they can I said absolutely no it was pretty heroical at that moment but I was determined. Wish I could forget you, but you're here to stay. It seems I met you when my love went away, and now I start each day by saying to you. And I was determined not not only a, it was a, not a regular sort of human human curiosity. It was actually actually visceral curiosity or something. Not because we were deprived, but because the jazz and these great great people who uh, who served jazz. Um, uh, Represented much bigger, much bigger, much bigger uh, thing, but much bigger understanding than just jazz itself. It was for us again symbol of freedom, symbol of symbol of freedom. Not only because it's a it's an American phenomenon, but because within the jazz music they were taking so much freedoms in terms of improvising, in terms of rhythmical freedom, in terms of you know doing all these things, all the important things, uh, which jazz really is. And uh, so I was lucky because I just played the concert there. So manager of the hall in Portland Civic, Civic Center, uh, a huge auditorium filled 
obviously. Um, uh, told me that, would you like to meet Miss Fitzgerald? And, you know, I couldn't, I, I didn't believe what he was telling me. And I said, are you kidding me? Of course, of course, I mean, how, but how can I even, yeah, she, she heard you, there was at least a new Bessendorf for piano, and and uh, d b before the, even the concert started, manager asked me, "Would you please try this new Bessendorf for piano we had?" And while I was doing my box and, and what not classical music, apparently uh, inner inner microphone the radio was working and. They both, Peterson and Fitzgerald, picked up some classical music. They couldn't believe who, who was doing this stuff. Anyway, she wanted, she knows the, you are here and wants to meet you. Right? Yeah, and, um, you know, I mean, only thing I could do, and happened automatically, not because I meant to do it, immediately when I saw her, I went on my knees right away and she already couldn't see not only far but even a couple of couple of um, feet away from her but she felt that my voice now was coming from mm -hmm. from down there not from a regular place and she said hey get up get up get up and I kissed her dress I did some things which were pretty dramatically theatrical but I meant, and I would do absolutely the same for day two. How old were you? I was 25. Okay. I was 25, and then uh, there are some, <laughs> luckily, luckily there are some bad, but how can it be bad photo with Ella Fitzgerald next to you? <laughs> I mean, it cannot be a bad photo. Uh, also with uh, Oscar Peterson. So then what happened was, you know, it's only, only you can see this kind of thing in movies or, or books, not in reality, but it did happen to me. So during her actually second concert, one was at seven o'clock, another was at 10 o'clock, um, and uh, uh, she started to sing, it was about to sing Mr. Paganin, the famous uh, song she was doing all her life and right before that she started to talk about Paganini being a classical musician and she said by the way this Russian guy came to me in the backstage and apparently they know me and they know us in so by the way where are what's what's his name she started to yell to backstage and obviously they couldn't get the name uh, from there or anywhere but anyway She's, she says, you told me you are going to be on my second concert. Where are you? And I hear something and I, ha I have a feeling that this is not happening. I mean, it cannot be true. But it was. She repeated again, where are you? And then, you know, I, I, I got up. What else I could do? I got up from my, I remember it was a fifth or fourth or fifth row. I got up. Obviously, she cannot see. She cannot see. Not only fourth row, right in front of her, she cannot see. Nothing. Almost. And she says, and all of a sudden, the light picked me up. 
And I was up and uh, so, sort of acknowledging myself and sat down and said, again, she started to yell, where are you? And, and okay, come, on, come over here, she says, just, just like. And how I went to up, up to stage, stage, I did, I did went to her. And there, here he is. I mean, it was unbelievable. I, I can't believe it happened to me, but it did. And anyways, and uh, what? Say whatever, say whatever you told me in the backstage. Say it again. And here I am with microphone. It's Ella next to me. Joppa sitting right there. Ray Brown is was on the, ba in the, in the bass. And anyway. I told her that, you know, you are a legend, not only for this audience, but for all of us in Soviet Union. You are our goddess. Mm -hmm. And I again did my natural gestures and isn't he, isn't he sweet and isn't he started to joke with me. Oh my God, it was amazing. But Funny thing is, it's not funny at all. When I went back, and the same wonderful meeting was with Oscar, same, very meaningful. Uh, when I went back, and by that, by that time, you know, I played very important concerts for me in the United States, which means Carnegie Hall, which means uh, Kennedy Center with many other great places, Boston, etc. Nobody ever asked me anything about my concerts. Everybody was asking about my meeting with Peterson and Ella Fitzgerald. That's how, that's how people were mesmerized with, with these great artists of American jazz. Many of them I can go and name. And that was a huge influence also thanks to, uh, again, I, I must say, entire community of musicians. You know, funny thing, here its division is so sharp and so kind of unmixed. If you're classical, you're classical. You're jazz, you're jazz. You're pop, you're pop. Not so in Soviet Union. Not so at all. Actually, not so in Europe too. Look how many fantastic composers have a tremendous influence on, of jazz in 20th century.
Lexo, we just heard you play the Prokofiev Seventh Piano Sonata, and you play it differently, certainly than the composer would have played it, and differently than Richter played it, and indeed differently than anyone else plays it. What impresses me is the authenticity of feeling. And you've investigated this piece very creatively and empathetically, and you've thought about wartime and Prokofiev's experience of wartime and the general Russian experience of wartime. And this exercise has profoundly impacted your experience of this music and the manner in which you present it. Can I get you to talk about that? I think it's important because it's an element of interpretation that's very little discussed or even practiced. You take its bits of information from listening something from books, for humans, teachers, and then you, then you put this kaleidoscope of ideas together and it changes, changes your attitude. For instance, Zach told me, Yakov Zak, great pianist. So, and one of my teachers, that Prokofiev was very much after off beats, not the down beats. Mm -hmm. For instance, not like the ta ka ka ta ka dam pa dam pa dam pa da. That's a, that because this that's a march. We don't need march here. We need ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka dam ta ra ta ra ta ra. So off beat the six eights, as it's written is almost as important as downbeat. So offbeat becomes as important as downbeat. Once I have this feeling that Prokofiev might have, you know, asked Zach to do that, and Zach was as pedantical towards the text yeah. of anybody, yeah. anybody, Prokofiev included, as one can get. At least I never saw more, more pedant are very strongly believing in te textual clarity of musician. And when he started to started to instigate with me and push me towards the offbeats, it entirely changed actually most of Prokofiev's music for me. Mm. So now offbeat becomes equally, maybe even more important. One of the notions of importance of music, <laughs> I was told and taught, is to get off these dumb bar lines. But well, that's what Prokofiev is doing. To basically. get rid of the bar lines. Yeah. So we don't have the no. grid of a no. downbeat that's falling Get rid of scratch them, but right. you know, can't scratch them, actually. Well, some try. Well, I think you eliminate those bar lines in the first movement. It actually sounds, as you play it, like a piece that's notated without bar lines. He has, I mean, all sorts of things coming. You have, you have all this crunch, and all this collision of metal to metal, and, and all this, uh, you know, degeneratic feeling of war, literally ugly sounds. And you have to not to shy. I, mean, I, I always emphasize on, in a, on, on a dissonance. Always dissonantic emphasis. Right. As much dissonantic emphasis and offbeat rhythm as possible. So it's a, this, but at the same time, it has to be organized. Organizational point on that level is only your straightforward emotional drive and line. And that's sometimes it organizes, sometimes it destroys it completely. The, then then once you get there, then, okay, it's done. We know it's a war. As a subsequent, we have tragic losses and tragic cries of, of women, sisters, daughters, primarily women, 
because primarily they are who stayed. And it's the drops of, of tears, which is this efflux which start, start this, um, starts with the second subject, the drops of tears coming, repeated four times, repeated uh, and not only once, uh, several times. So those are ingredients which I am trying to, uh, trying to, uh, what, should, what should I say? I mean, <laughs> silly word, illustrate. I'm not trying to illustrate. I actually am trying to cry. And that's silly too, because if you are crying about your own performance, <laughs> nothing can be more stupider. But I am trying to capture this, this unspeakable sadness, which is in these four notes. Do you care to reflect on how your performance of this sonata may have changed over the decades that you've, that you've played it? You know, I'm sure it has changed in many ways, but in many ways I was just, when I was talking about this sonata with you, I realized that you know, same things we were talking about, for instance, slowing down in the second subject or first moment or playing second moment a bit slower than it's, even if it is indica it's, it's indicated. I was doing very same things when in 19, I, I, obviously I remember that, in 1969, December, it's a Tallinn, Estonia, and it's a Soviet Union piano competition, which is a basically a stage to get to the Tchaikovsky piano competition. And I was playing uh, Prokofiev's Seventh Sonata, and I remember, I remember vividly how some musicians would tell me that if I play second subject of, of Seventh Sonata, Prokofiev, that slow, I'm not passing anywhere. And if I play the second moment that slow, that's a death penalty. Don't do that. You cannot do this. You cannot. That's a big competition. They will cut your <laughs> everything. Yeah. But same thing applies with Opus 109 of Beethoven, the third moment. The theme I was playing for them very slow. I still play the thing slow. Yeah. It's a perfect uh, it, characterization of what we were talking about before, which is the second subject of the first movement of the Prokofiev Seventh Piano Sonata, right. with those repeated notes, which in your rendition are not only slow, but almost placid or static. Right, static. 
you know, study. And that's completely characteristic of your style of performance. That's right. It's something ritualistic. The ritualistic, yeah. right. So maybe we can, as a sequel to this, this exegesis, attempt to say something about the notion of authenticity. notion of authenticity in performance of classical music seems to me simplistic and misleading. There is a conventional wisdom that the more literal you are in rendering the score musically, the more authentic your interpretation is. But I think you're talking about a deeper experience of authenticity there's an obligation which you honor to take music as seriously as possible and attempt to use it in a way that inhabits your being. That's something that most people don't even attempt. I don't know how it came to you because that's the way you make music. You let it infiltrate your feelings and your thoughts as profoundly as possible and then something comes out. Maybe what I'm doing doesn't require commentary. Maybe I'm making my own comment. But that seems to me authentic. I cannot comment on that because I realize that, you know, this it's not that, I mean, that's the only way I can sit on stage, really. I mean, there's no way if, you know, I have to, I have to try, I have to try to interest myself what I'm playing at that very moment. I have to, even if it is, even if I play this 50 years or 50 years time or whatnot, I have to be, I have to be involved in, in, in every notes, every note curving and out other note and coming back. I have to be physically or you know, almost, at least with my ears and eyes, I have to, especially for whatever inside I, I can apply, to get, be, be involved, interested in that millisecond of my life. Uh, in, on stage, yes, in most of most of my great colleagues and friends, dear friends, they say, "Well, you don't play Prokofiev, you play yourself." Well, if it is so, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry, but I tried to, I tried to be. <laughs> I tried to be. Uh, yes, I'm. Yes, I'm trying to be Prokofiev, <laughs> which is silly thing to say. But um, I'm attempting to, with those informations which I have from many musicians and some teachers and notions and some people who absolutely, absolutely were either his contemporaries or right next generation and loved and worshipped him, whatever I gather information from them, then I use it to yes to try to try to try to be at least not and i'm not trying to be a co-author or what what not no but i want to leave this smoothing music through every millisecond of its being on stage maxim told me another things which cannot i mean it's a self compliment when i'm repeating it but I mean, he, he did say that, and you know we didn't play his father's music. Although we did play um, first concert with him in Carnegie Hall with Maxim Shostakovich, uh, we played Rachmaninoff Third, and that was in Santiago, Chile, yeah. and we played three concerts plus two rehearsals. So five times we played it. Yeah. He says, "Exo, you know." Every five times you are so damn different, it's disaster to accompany you. 
I said, I know, I'm so sorry. But you know what? My father would have liked it, he said. I said, really? Why? Because he said the music cannot be repeated the same way it was already done. So a pianist who comes to music with their own culture, their own personality and musical personality, there has to be a kind of mediation between their musical and personal identity and that of the composer. You can't just surrender to the composer, or you surrender yourself. You mentioned returning to the Opus 109 Piano Sonata by Beethoven, and you talked to me about how difficult that was for you to find yourself in that music again, and how important it was for you to extrapolate a story. Story is very... It, it's... 109 is dedicated Beethoven's sonata number 30, 109. E major is dedicated to, to Maximiliano Brentano. Maximiliano Brentano was uh, at that time, at that, during the composition of that piece, was 13, 12, 13 years old daughter of Bettina Brentano, with with, with whom Beethoven had a, uh, well, th there, is, there is such an idea that immortal beloved was Bettina Brentano. How, truth, how much truth is there, it's, it's, it's a different subject, but that's one of the reasons. Uh, in Carlo Vivari, where Beethoven went to be a guest of actually Bettina's family, uh, was the period when he was composing that piece. In a third moment, besides the, besides the, 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 you know, love, basically love story, which is in a theme and definitely first variation is full of love. And, mm -hmm. You know, I'm getting an extremely dangerous territory here speaking about it, but it's a, my personal take that entire, entire relationship with its running away, uh, uh, mythical runaway uh, f from from reality variation, which is for me, for instance, the fast variation, bum 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 bum, ra, pa, pa, or uh, or spooky variation, the the second variation, which is actually on the staccati, uh, hiding, hiding hiding from everything variation and drawing some accidental keys and and then again love affair variation one before the fugue or fugato whatever you call it and then somehow it coming to conclusion with all this all these mystical magical thrills with themes theme going and harmony going and left uh, Force on the fifth finger and steam going the fifth finger on the right hand, and then and then coming and conclu concluding as it started in, in the steam. This has for me why? Because dedication is to Maximiliano Brentano. Maximiliano Brentano is a daughter of Bettina Brentano. And Bettina Brentano he could not dedicate his sonata to Bettina Brentano in my opinion because then it, his love would have been very obvious. Just the same way like Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto is dedicated to Nikolai Dahl, his, presumably his doctor, but in fact he meant his niece. Second Piano, this, is, this comes from Alexander Rachmaninoff. I didn't create that, that notion. Alexander Rachmaninoff, grandson of Rachmaninoff, told me 
me and two of my sons, by the way. In, um, we were in um, Ravello, Italy, and that's where he told me during this old myth about Nikolai Dahl's dedication to uh, dedication to the second concerto is absolute BS. He only dedicated it to Nikolai Dahl uh, because he could not dedicate it to Elena Dahl. Um, and the reason why he couldn't dedicate to Elena Dahl, because then Natalia, his wife, told him that he would, she would immediately divorce him if he would even dare so. that. What I like about the story about the 109 mm. and your interpretation is that it doesn't matter whether or not it's true. It doesn't matter whether it's true that Beethoven had in mind his immortal beloved in composing these variations. It's true for you. That's enough. <laughs> for you, it's an instrument of interpretation. It lets you inhabit the music yeah it uh, definitely you know i i guess uh, i guess since since i'm not a composer at least i can create some stories to uh, to 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 try to make them kind of my own which is a kind of silly silly trying a notion but here we are that's what it is. Whether it's silly, uh, we'll let others decide. <laughs>